So to begin with today's webinar, um, I'll first introduce myself. My name is Evangeline Arathwala. Some of you might already know me. Uh, I'm the alumni engagement officer at the CSC, and today I'm joined by my colleague Jin Liang Chu, who is managing the waiting room for us today. Thank you, Jin Liang. On behalf of the CSC, I welcome you all to this webinar on smart energy for cleaner cities. This webinar is part of the CSE's Climate Action webinar series. And today we have with us Commonwealth alumnus Olamide Oguntoye from Nigeria. Um, you can all see him on the screen. Olamide has, uh, sorry, he currently works at the Tony Blair Institute for Global Change, where he leads projects on science and innovation. His interest is in helping world leaders build a sustainable future through effective energy, climate, and technology policies. I'm also pleased to mention that Olamide is a 2014 Commonwealth Shared Scholar from Nigeria. He completed his MSc in Design and Innovation for Sustainability at Cranfield University. Thank you so much for joining us today, Olamide, and for presenting on your topic and your expertise. Uh, I will now leave the floor to you for your presentation. And on behalf of the CSE, welcome. Right. Thank you very much, um, Evangeline, and thanks to the team for putting this together. Um, it's a pleasure to be here and to be presenting this webinar. Um, my name, like um, Evangelina has rightly said, is Olamide, I'm the tech policy lead at the Tony Blair Institute, and I focus on energy and climate um, solutions. Um, so today, I'm going to be presenting on the topic, smart energy for cleaner cities. Um, um, okay. Sorry, I was just about to mention, I can't see the title slide, but thank you for moving to the next uh, slide. Thank you. Okay, right, sure. Um, so yeah, smart energy for um, cleaner cities. This is quite an interesting topic um, that um, has been getting um, different kind of in, uh, interest and attention um, from different stakeholders, um, especially from um, urban government and urban um, 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 leadership um, from around the world. Um, cities all around the world are starting to think more proactively about climate change and what role that they can play in it. Um, and at the ongoing COP26 conference, um, you have cities um, through coalitions um, and through different um, sort of collaborations and organizations aptly represented at the conference. And one of the topics um, that should be of, on the radar um, is how to best leverage technology. Um, so what are we gonna cover in the webinar? Um, four things. First of all, I'm gonna talk about um, getting smarter with technology. So, you know, why is it even important um, for cities um, to be actively thinking about it? Um, secondly, um, I'm going to introduce the concept of energy clocks. Uh, we have published a paper at the Tony Blair Institute addressing the topic and the concept of energy clocks. So what are they and why should cities care about them? And what can we all do um, to make them work? So that's going to be the second thing. Um, the third thing is about when the clocks tick, which is pretty much um, an analogy for what needs to happen um, to make energy clocks work effectively in cities, what conditions must be fulfilled um, to make energy clocks um, a reality. And then finally, we're going to talk about um, key recommendations for cities, both in the global north and the global south, you know, high income and low and middle income countries, and what should they do differently going forward. All right. Okay, so I'll get on with it. So why do cities um, need to get um, active um, with thinking about technology um, as they think about um, climate change? Um, one of the first reasons is that technology provides um, a big opportunity to achieve the sustainable development goals. Um, there is a goal number um, 13, which is about climate action. I'm sure that's something that many of us are familiar with. And the climate action has been encapsulated in very brilliantly um, in the Paris Agreement um, to try and limit global warming to a maximum of two degrees above pre-industrial level. Um, and by all means, go for as much as maximum of 1.5 degrees above pre-industrial level. Um, so climate action is all about 
achieving those two objectives. And you can see from this chart um, what possible scenarios are there when you involve technologies like artificial intelligence. So if you go on a business as usual trajectory, um, there is only so much you can do to achieve the Paris Agreement. But um, by introducing um, technology, um, you know, the latest um, developments in machine learning, in artificial intelligence, in big data analytics, uh, and some of these frontier um, technological areas, um, we have a chance to achieve our Paris Agreement targets um, much faster and get closer to the target. Of course, technology is not the only thing that needs to um, be in the mix. There's a whole range of other activities. There's a behavioral change that needs to happen. There is the policy that needs to um, happen as well um, to get us even further into the target zone. Um, but climate action, SDG number 13, is very critical. Um, apart from SDG 13, we have a few other SDGs, including things like the SDG 9, which is about industry, innovation, and infrastructure, which technology also plays a very key role in and SDG 7, which is about affordable and clean um, access to modern energy services, which technology also plays a big role in. So for, that, for those reasons, um, technology um, is going to be very critical for cities thinking about climate action and climate change. Um, there have been all kinds of interests um, from different cities. So you have you know, all kinds of smart city projects um, and they are labeled many in different, many different ways around the world where cities are trying to get smarter and kind of introducing as much new fancy technologies as, as they are. Um, but the goal is not so much about just stuffing the urban spaces with more tech and making sure every other street light is another standing robot that can do all sorts of things. Um, and there have been all kinds of failures and fiascos are around the implementation of technological programs in cities around the world. Um, the very famous one is the um, sidewalk smart city plan in Toronto. Um, this chart here shows how you know, the focus has been very much around um, the fancy words, the keywords, innovation, data, infrastructure, um, but it's less about the people. Um, and that's one of the reasons why that project um, in Toronto, the sidewalk project, um, they didn't take off because um, it's neglected or it kind of omitted um, some key to co critical components uh, for technologies to work effectively in cities. So it's not as, as straightforward as it sometimes appear and it's important for cities to be more deliberate in how they engage technology. Um, also, one of the key reasons again um, is that technology, I mean, um, helps across many different sectors um, to drive down the emissions um, fast. Um, so all the way from the way we produce the electricity that we use in our homes and in our buildings, to the way we heat, our, heat up our buildings, to the way we commute from point A to point B, and to the way we grow our food, technology has a critical role. And this is a chart that summarizes um, some of the key milestones that we need to hit um, as far as technology is concerned, which was produced by the um, International Energy Agency. So again, this is also just another indication of the need for cities around the world to take technology very seriously. Um, but then I'm um, going beyond um, just, you know, the importance of technology um, for climate action. Um, we are thinking, we are proposing a concept, uh, you know, creating the concept of energy clocks. Um, and I'm gonna go into the details in a, in a, um, in a, in a moment. So energy clocks um, came up um, as we started to look through the various aspects of technology for climate action and the role of data and how it can help um, cities um, get smarter in how they manage um, energy, which is a big um, source of emissions. Um, so what are energy clocks? So energy clocks are a category of technology solutions um, that can be implemented in cities and they are data oriented, they are cloud-based, and they are pretty much like a cloud aggregation platform for energy data. Um, some of you might already be aware that energy um, production um, is responsible for a significant um, amount of global emissions. Um, some estimates put it at over 70%. Um, so if you're gonna be tackling climate change and you're gonna be reducing emissions, 
then one of the key areas to focus on is energy. Of course, there are quite a number of other areas, for example, agriculture and land use, which is responsible for a significant amount of um, CO2 emissions, as well as methane emissions. Um, but the energy production um, cycle, all the way from generation to transmission to consumption, um, is an important one to focus on. And the energy clocks are there um, to serve as an optimization platform. And how do they work? They are simply um, cloud-based data solutions that connect the dots between how and where energy is used um, and um, how you can optimize that energy use um, on a system level. So if you think about energy optimization, you think about making a light bulb in a house more energy efficient. So maybe going from a 60 kilowatts incandescent bulb or a 60 you know, watts incandescent bulb to going for like a 15 watt, which is far smaller, CFL bulb, which is you know the energy efficient bulb that we are all familiar with. But that's efficiency on a very minute level. It's about one appliance or one gadget at a time. Um, but how about when we start to think about it more holistically, where it's connecting a building in this part of the city to another building in that part of the city and looking at the patterns of energy use between those two buildings and optimizing it. That is where energy clocks come to play. Um, so in very simple terms, um, I'll make a quick comparison between energy clocks as we conceptualize it and familiar concepts like you know the smart meters, which many um, are familiar with, uh, which we have in our homes, um, and also emission inventory systems, which are gaining traction. Um, in terms of their applications, energy clocks are far more varied um, in the way that they can be applied. Um, so they can be applied um, on a, an individual building to building um, level, and they can also be applied on a citywide um, um, level. Um, whereas the alternatives like smart meters are, you know, they're not necessarily alternatives, they're just concepts that can help us, you know, visualize how energy clocks work. In a smart meter, you have one operating in an apartment or in a building um, at one time. Um, and there's only so much data you can get from it. Um, but energy clocks, on the other hand, um, has a, a more robust um, coverage. Um, in terms of the data sources, um, energy clocks also have a more robust coverage because they get information and data from um, not only um, buildings, but also from things like um, you know, how um, the vehicles, for example, if you have electric vehicles, um, being connected to the grid around the building, how the vehicles are also being used and how the, um, um, the, the, the energy usage pattern and how you can optimize it alongside the way you optimize the one from the building. So the data sources are more varied, so you can connect the transport i.e., and mobility um, to data to it, and as well as the um, energy data from, from buildings as well. Um, in terms of updates, it's more real time, um, even though real time seems to be the goal, um, but you know it's achievable in the long run. Usually, towards the end of, um, for example, towards the end of this presentation, I'm going to share a few tips on how cities can implement energy clocks. Um, and in terms of access, um, energy clocks are open access, so the data that they contain or they provide um, can be provided to third-party developers, um, software solution developers who can then build independent apps um, of the energy clock platform. Um, so. Why is it important for cities to um, think about um, energy clocks? Um, one of the reasons is because it has a wide range of applications, um, all the way from how the city generates and transmits and uses power and electricity, um, to the way it manages electricity and energy use in the buildings, um, to transport, and then to things like water and, and, and waste, rather. Um, and across all of these different sectors, um, energy clocks have an opportunity to contribute to emission reduction to a varying amount um, across each sector. So one of the biggest um, areas, as you can see rightly from this chart, is in the buildings. In buildings, there is a wide opportunity um, to achieve a kind of a, a, a wide range um, of emission um, reduction um, in cities. And also the same applies um, in the transport sector, where energy clocks can play an important role. Um, I also need to mention at this point that one of the estimates that we made um, from just looking at different scenarios of energy clocks um, application around the world um, is that it can potentially save cities up to $100 billion um, annually 
in terms of how much they spend on energy purchase. Because the more efficient you get in using energy, um, the less you have to invest in buying um, energy because you, can, you are more efficient and you're using less. Um, so cities around the world have up to $100 billion um, worth of potential savings. Um, and you can find a range of applications already, not necessarily on a full blown um, scale, um, but in just you know, minute small pockets of success um, in different cities around the world where cities are using energy data innovatively. So in, in Finland, the city of Lati has launched um, EU's first personal carbon trading scheme. And that's the scheme that allows people to track their energy data and in addition, their emission data um, on a personal level. So when they are in a building, when they are going and commuting from point A to point B, um, the system allows them to track their data. And in that process, they can tell when they have exceeded a certain threshold and can also um, trade um, excesses and buy um, credits um, from peer, peer to peer. Um, so that's a smart ap um, application of energy clocks. And you find many other um, applications um, around the world. So um, having talked about energy clocks and some of this um, cool or potentially um, useful use of, um, of, of technology and smart technology, um, what are the things that need to happen um, for energy clocks to work effectively um, in cities? One of the things that needs to happen um, is for cities to adopt a renewable plus energy clocks mindset. And what is this, what, what, are, what do I mean by this? Um, so a lot of the time when cities talk about um, getting greener or going greener um, with energy, a lot of the conversation is about how do we transition to getting more renewables in our grids? How do we make sure that our homes um, in this city are powered by electricity from the nearby um, wind, wind plants um, or, or, or the solar plants? Um, that's a very good start. And in addition to that, um, cities need to begin thinking more about, okay, yes, we get renewables, but um, how do we also get efficient on a whole level, a whole new level, a systemic level on how we use um, the renewable energy? Because as you can rightly tell, renewables are intermittent. Um, they are not always available. Um, sun shines in the daytime. Um, wind is not always blowing. Um, you need to have some kind of storage which is um, batteries. Um, and then with the limited amount of energy which a battery can store, you want to be very efficient in how you use it. Um, so beyond just thinking about renewables, um, cities need to think um, also about getting efficient. And that's where energy clocks come in. And you can already see um, some signs of progress from um, leading technology companies. So for example, um, you know, the likes of, of, I mean, the company that has now become, uh, that has now changed its name to Meta, um, you know, you have Google, you have Amazon. In the US, these companies alone um, had more renewable energy purchase in 2020 than um, the US cities. Um, that just goes on to show that there is a massive um, interest in going green with energy purchase. Um, but then on top of that, you now have some of these tech companies also not just get going, getting more renewable um, um, power supply, but also implementing strategies for um, momentary management of energy use. So for example, uh, Microsoft um, introduced the 24 seven renewable procurement um, strategy that allows it to procure renewable energy on a you know, hourly basis. And the idea is to move towards something more real time. So they can tell because they are implementing um, data monitoring solutions, um, to tell, you know, yes, we're pro procuring renewable energy, but then we also have enough data to tell how well we are using this energy and what we need to do in the next hour and what we need to do in the hour after that. So it's on a hourly basis. And, you know, the amount of investment that goes into energy data um, is significant in addition to that of renewables. And that's the direction of travel for cities as, as well. Um, the second and very critical thing um, that needs to happen for energy clocks to be the reality is for cities to have um, propositions that work for different stakeholder groups. Um, because for you to implement energy clocks successfully, um, you need to be talking to and working effectively with a wide variety of stakeholder groups, which includes um, utilities, 
uh, and the energy suppliers, um, you know, real estate and property development companies, um, you know, fleet operators, um, and you know, tech companies who can provide the data um, solutions and the data interfaces. So all of these different groups have you know different incentives and different drives and market um, motivations. Um, so for the city who wants energy clocks to work effectively, they have to be able to serve as the convener um, of an effective proposition that gets people um, from those different sectors together um, to be able to develop and to build um, effective energy clocks. So that's another key thing that is critical um, for energy clocks to work effectively. And the third and not but the least is um, the institutional collaboration that needs to happen um, needs to be seamless. So in many government structures um, around the world, you do find one ministry dedicated to you know, transport, another ministry dedicated to industry, another ministry dedicated to land use, which is responsible for buildings and things like that. Um, but for you to have an effective um, rollout of energy clocks, um, there needs to be more synergy um, between um, those otherwise siloed um, ministries. Um, and that's where leadership, skill, and coordination come in. Um, and you do find um, on this chart on the left, says number of authorities per city government with control over one, more, one or more strategic assets. So it's just saying that you know, in some of these countries and regions, you do have multiple government agencies having control or jostling for control over just one piece of um, um, state assets or city assets. Um, for things like that to be effective, then you need to get um, stronger leadership and stronger skill um, and coordination working. Um, so based on all of these requirements, um, what are the key takeaways for city officials and authorities um, who want to implement um, energy clocks and not only as energy clocks, but who just want to get smarter with how they use energy and how they reduce emissions. First is uh, develop an attractive proposition to align stakeholders, which was which connects to the point I made previously. Um, and this is an example of a project that was implemented in Bristol, um, the Leap, Bristol City LEAP program where they invited um, participants to express interest um, in a program that could potentially um, slash the emission rates in Bristol significantly. And these charts just show the diversity of um, submissions and actors that um, got involved in the program and how you have people and organizations from different sectors and from you know, different um, focus areas within the energy and climate um, innovation ecosystem. So it's, it's, it's a very broad spectrum. So you have you know, those who focus very much on energy, those who focus on transport, the community, the finance, it's a broad spectrum of um, stakeholders. Um, and having that attractive proposition that unifies all the parties is extremely critical. Um, the second thing that cities need to think of differently um, as they think about getting smarter with um, uh, data and with um, technology is to address innovation barriers um, beyond renewables. So if you look at the energy clocks and similar data-driven tech solutions, you find multiple layers um, of, of systems that all need to work hand in hand um, for them to be effective. So on one layer, you have you know, the sensing, which captures the data. So for example, the data from the smart meters in the homes that gets transmitted to the cloud. Um, you have data from electric vehicles that also get transmitted to the cloud. You have data from multiple sources, and that's just the sensing layer. But then transmitting the data to the cloud is just one thing. You know, In the cloud, you need to have the processing. You need to have the... Um, um, computational horsepower to be able to crunch the, the data and to be able to make um, 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 uh, it extract value from it. And on this multiple layers, um, there are all kinds of innovations that need to happen. And it's important for cities to think actively about the potential blocks and the potential barriers um, to innovation. So for example, um, if you want to implement um, energy clocks in a city where smart meters have not been well rolled out or they've not been widespread, that's already a barrier 
because, because without the smart meters, you can't even get the sensing layer right. Um, and without the sensing layer, you cannot get the processing layer on top of it and the other layers on top of it. So those barriers need to be addressed um, systematically. Um, and the third and final thing that needs to happen, and this is particularly for um, cities and urban centers in low and middle income countries, is to first of all, target closing the infrastructure gap. Um, at the moment, there is still a massive gap um, in terms of internet access, for example, in lots of low and middle income countries um, and lots of infrastructure gaps as well um, that prevents the widespread rollouts of energy um, tech solutions, um, which pretty much which connects to the previous points around addressing innovation, um, gaps in innovation layers. Um, but in this case, it's more about infrastructure. Um, so every city will belong to a stage in that, on that journey um, of closing infrastructure gaps and being ready for rolling out energy clocks. Um, but for those on the lower uh, or further behind, um, the priority for them would be to focus on closing the infrastructure gaps, uh, making sure that um, you, know, you can already have, first of all, you even have you know, <laughs> the, the energy networks um, in place. Uh, you have more grid connections. You have um, some of the un unconnected peri-urban communities um, that are, you know, you need to first of all, get them connected. Uh, we need to have um, the, the, the data communication and, you know, connectivity and 5G um, infrastructure and, you know, even 3G and 4G are fine as well. Uh, infrastructure, you need to have them in place. And you need to have a whole ton of other um, infrastructure rail gaps closed um, before you can start to think about um, um, implementing energy clocks. So those three things are going to be extremely critical for cities generally um, around the world. Um, so I'll just wrap up by saying that the CSC, uh, the Commonwealth Shared Scholarship, uh, which I was a beneficiary of some years ago, um, has made a significant difference. Um, having benefited from it, I've gone ahead to do a whole range of projects um, across different countries, um, in different industries, and focusing on different topics. And the Energy Clocks is just one concept or one project out of several others um, that I've been part of. So countries all the way from the UK to Germany, Uganda, Kenya, South Africa, um, and industries ranging from utilities um, to construction, and of course, right now, um, public policy. Uh, lots of interesting projects, I must say, and um, many of them started by you know, taking that first step uh, with the um, CSC scholarship in the UK. So. Um, I would say that's for me is a highlight of being a, an alumnus um, of this program and so happy to connect with you all and um, now is the time to um, get smarter for cities now is the time for cities to get smarter and I believe there are people here on this webinar or people who will be watching this video after now who are one way or the other connected to cities either working directly in city governments or working as advisors, or who just have some form of influence or the other um, on cities. Um, now is the time for us to take this message one step further and drive um, the idea of making cities smarter and, and cleaner. So at this point, I just want to say thank you to everyone for listening and um, looking forward to questions. Thank you so much, um, Olamide, for that wonderful webinar presentation on your work and also your expertise. I am pleased to let you know that we already have questions coming in in the chat box. So um, without wasting any further time and to provide more room for questions and engagement, I would now like to open um, or start the Q&A session if you are ready for it. Absolutely, thanks very much, Eva, yeah. <laughs> Looking Great, forward. thank yeah. you, thank you. Um, for attendees who would still like to send in your questions, please do so using the chat box. Um, and I will indicate if you would like to unmute yourself and ask your questions directly to the speaker, um, or if you'd uh, like me to ask your question to the speaker. 
So to begin with the questions, I would now like to invite uh, Jeanette to please unmute yourself and ask your question to uh, the speaker, please. Yeah, hi. Thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, it was a very interesting uh, point of view towards climate change. And it, so my main question was like, what is the cost effectiveness of this project? You mentioned about the infrastructure, but the energy clocks itself. And secondly, I was thinking like, who would track these clocks? Like, is it an individual responsibility of the like buildings or the cars, wherever the clocks are, or it's some uh, authority, some authority looking after the counts and everything. Yep. Yeah, thanks very much, Jeanette. Um, so the two questions are very interesting. Um, so the first one about cost effectiveness, um, that is something that um, is going to be, uh, first of all, of course, based on different contexts and different um, cities. Um, for some who already have a, a decent level of data connectivity and you know, data infrastructure, of, you can reckon that it's going to be relatively straightforward um, to implement um, energy clock solution because it's very data heavy, it's very um, you know, data infrastructure heavy, um, and therefore the additional costs um, for cities in that situation will be lower. Um, however, for those who are a bit further behind um, in terms of how much data systems have already been rolled out, um, how much smart meters they already have um, um, installed, um, for such cities, of course, the cost um, is going to be um, significantly higher. Um, but on, on the contrary side, um, the, the gains are, you know, the they in the long run tend to be significant as well. Um, so I mentioned the point about um, potential savings for cities, um, which is up to the tune of $100 billion annually. And for cities, for some cities, they are the ones who are responsible for the purchase of energy supply and electricity supply um, on behalf of their residents. And then they get the money back um, from the residents. And for some cities, it's a different model. So if it's a case where you know, so much money is being spent on energy procurement. Um, if you can then get more efficient with how you use the energy, then of course you lower the energy bills. And in the long run, that pays um, for the cost of, um, you know, the, the upfront investment in the, um, the energy clocks infrastructure. Um, so the city context will de determine the, the parameters um, of how much it costs um, and how much you can potentially make, um, you know, or save um, after installing or, or implementing energy clocks. Um, and to the second question about who drives or who is to drive um, the agenda, it's an agenda that is um, very multi-faceted and multi-stakeholder oriented. Um, and CTs, um, from our own point of view at the Institute, are uh, right at the center and they should be the convener um, to drive the agenda because you know, it's very likely for each individual private sector company to just carry on doing their own thing, focusing on the next quarterly performance and the next quarterly um, profit. Um, but for you to bring all of these parties together, the utilities, the fleet owners, the buildings, um, you need someone who is more central and who has um, a less commercial interest, um, which is the city. So the city is the most um, important convener in this situation. Thank you, Jeanette, for your question to our speaker. Uh, moving on, we have a question from, we have quite a few questions on energy clocks, but I would now like to invite Mohamed Adin to ask his questions before we go to the other questions on energy clocks. Uh, Mohamed, would you like to unmute yourself and ask your question, please? Okay, thank you so much, um, for a nice presentation. Uh, I'm actually uh, interested about the topic and very interesting, but I'm not actually clear about the energy clock um, as a layman. I mean, a different, you know, uh, <laughs> non-tech background. Can you make it clear um, uh, more about the energy clock and how it works? That would be great um, for non-tech background. <laughs> uh, 
what is energy clock and how it works? A simple question. Thank you so much for your nice presentation. Right. Thanks very much, Mohammed. Um, so one way to um, bring it to life is to think a bit um, about the home. So your, your, you know, our homes and our houses. Um, there has been a wave of transitioning from um, energy efficient light bulbs, for example, you know, and that's a very minute sort of transition um, to the level where we have an interconnected set of appliances in our homes. Um, so if you think about the, the light bulb, you know, prior to now, everybody has used the incandescent bulb, the traditional, very hot 60 watts um, bulb that is, um, 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 that is so um, energy um, intense in its in the energy consumption. Um, but now we all tend to prefer the compact fluorescent tubes, those little CFL tubes, which are far more energy efficient. Um, on a scale of 100 hours of usage, the CFL tube, you know, can be about 15%, uh, can use up like almost like about 15% of the energy used by the, um, the, the, the older technologies. So that's the, that's the little analogy for what has happened in that case. But in today's age, um, you have a situation where the appliances in the home are you know, more connected. You have the smart home where the ACs and the lights are interconnected. And while you're on your way back from work, um, you can alert your home to already get the temperature cooling for you ahead of your arrival. You know, that's because there is a sort of technology in place that connects the different appliances and tells them what to do. And it can tell you, you know, okay, when you get home at this particular point in time, you you know, it could be cool enough for you to, you know, do whatever it is you want to do. And so that level of interconnectivity between appliances gives a whole new level and definition to efficiency um, beyond what obtains when you think about the light bulb. Um, so the same thing applies in the case of the energy clocks, where all, all, all along we've been thinking about efficiency on a very minute individualistic level about, okay, my house should be efficient. Um, but the energy clocks has a way of scaling that up and making it you know, a cross-cutting city-wide um, um, efficiency um, solution. So data from different sources and different you know, buildings and different industries um, are being aggregated and optimized together um, on, a, on a level that unlocks a high, far higher level of efficiency than what you can ever achieve um, by doing individual things. Um, so that's pretty much what the energy clock does on, its, on, a, on a high level. Um, but you can just pretty much think about it as a data platform. You know, it's a cloud processing platform but then the data that gets into it is energy related data. And with that data, you can make informed decisions in real time. You can optimize which device or which areas go off or which areas slow down and which one goes faster. So just think about it as that um, cross-cutting data platform, which cities can use to optimize energy on a, on a large scale. Wonderful. Um, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Mohamed for sending that questions. And I do appreciate um, not all of us, including me, is from this background. So it's really uh, important to know the basic of um, the concept. So thank you so much for sharing that question. Um, I would now move on to the next question um, and would like to invite uh, Nicholas to please unmute yourself and ask your question. Thank you very much, Eva, and thank you, Olomide, for the good presentation. I've enjoyed it so much, and I've learned something about energy clocks. Actually, my first question was uh, related to the use of automation in street lighting, and that is uh, we have a system where we, we run street lights based on solar systems in my city, Kampala, and uh, most of them you switch on whenever it gets dark, and then once it gets light uh, in the morning, they just go on their own. And my, my first question was, are they using energy clocks? And I wanted to extend that question slightly more, that if they do use energy clocks, then we have another alternative sets of energy, and that is using hydroelectric power, which runs 24 hours and seven days a week. 
Of course, we don't use a lot of the power at night, and I'm beginning to think if energy blocks are all that efficient, can we use them to, to, to price the energy such that at some point in, in the night the energy is cheaper and someone can actually use it at a more cheaper rate than trying to use a charcoal that destroys the forest and therefore close climate change? Thank you. Yeah, thanks very much, Nicholas. That's a brilliant question of, you know, brilliant set of questions. So the first one about um, the smart street lights. Um, it is, in some sense, um, you know, is a, a version of energy clock. Um, however, it will not be, you know, the 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 the, the poster child um, of energy clock. So it's smart in the sense that it uses data from um, the insulation level. So there must be a sensor that senses how much brightness is out there, how much sunshine is get um, the, the light is getting, and that sensor generates data which is processed on a chip and the chip doesn't have to be um, connected to the cloud. It does not have to be internet based, rather it could be a you know, local processor that is based inside um, the, the street lights or it could be aggregated outside. Um, and based on the information that comes out of the processing, then it sends signal to the lights, um, to the street light to say, okay, now you can go off or now you can go on. Um, so that's a very simple automation um, system. Um, depending on how it is wired, you know, you might consider it um, as a component of energy clocks, but not necessarily all of it. So um, energy clocks ha have a more far reaching um, 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 sets of um, applications and um, data collections, data, data sources. So we are talking about optimizing buildings. So if you have an estate, for example, and you kind of have data on how the energy is being used across the entire estate, and you have a way to use that data to optimize um, the way the street lights in that estate operates, then you are in the domain of energy clocks. Um, but if it's only about the automated street light, you know, it's it's less about energy clocks in that instance. Um, and then to your second question about um, whether energy clocks can be used um, for the dynamic pricing of electricity, absolutely. And that's one of the um, opportunities that we identified in the area of um, power power generation and, um, and power distribution and, 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 and usage. Um, so if you're able to get enough data about the usage patterns of electricity in a given urban area, then it can also help in the pricing. And that's one of the propositions that cities need to provide um, when engaging utilities to say, you know, based on this system or the framework of the energy clocks we are proposing, you can even get smarter with how you price um, your electricity supply, so long as you stay within the limits provided by um, the law, of course. Um, but that's a potential um, angle and potential application as well. So yes, absolutely. Thank you, Nicholas, for your question. Um, I hope that was all the questions you had, Nicholas. Did you have any further questions to ask? Uh that's basically all the questions I had. So thank you so much for the, for the responses. Right, thank you. Thank you, Nicholas. Thank you so much. Um, I would now like to invite Shanmugam to unmute and ask your question, please. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Evangeline. Indeed, it's, it's one of the wonderful presentations I heard about, about uh, energy clock and the smart cities. It's indeed a very nice presentation. I really enjoy it. And uh, uh, the, one of the uh, the basic questions that I would like to know, uh, the smart clock can be bridged to industries uh, for the processes to undergo. Um, it's a, a smart energy clock. Can we link the industrial processes um, uh, to save the energy and to save the carbon uh, using the energy clock? Yeah, thanks very much for that question. So yeah, um, absolutely one of the application areas as well. So when we think about buildings in urban areas, so you, you have the residential, you have the commercial and industrial buildings, and the kinds of appliances that you have in those two kinds of buildings are different. So in the residential areas, you have your fridge and microwave and um, television, whereas in industry, you know, you have the boilers and the robotic arms and the automation tools and the conveyor belt. Um, energy clocks are applicable across the spectrum of urban buildings. Um, so both in residential and in commercial and industrial areas. Um, and you can already find, um, I think I mentioned previously also, um, some industries who are already taking the lead 
in applying energy clocks in renewable energy procurement. So for example, tech companies, um, which I mentioned in the U US, who are using the idea of smart um, data procurement, which is a concept under energy clocks, um, to define how they procure renewable energy on a hourly basis. And the direction of travel is to make that even more minute, even more granular, so that they can, in the future, be able to make decisions on a minute-to-minute -minute basis. Um, and the same thing can be, same principle can be applied also in other kinds of industries. So not necessarily tech industry, but even the regular, you know, manufacturing plants um, can also get smarter on how they use um, energy. So, for example, a manufacturing plant um, that already understands how the production cycle goes. So maybe you know for, for four hours they operate the boiler, and for the next two hours they operate some set of conveyor belt. Then and they can tell the energy usage pattern is different, and that can help to guide if they have enough data on it. That can help to guide how they procure energy and also um, the smarter things that they can do with energy. So energy clocks definitely are applicable in industries, um, wow. and it's for cities to um, be able to. Um, provide the, the rights and propositions to the different parties. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, okay. Nice answers. Thank you very much. All right, thank you. Thank you, Shanda, for your question. Moving on, we have a question from um, Roy, who is who's asking, how can small cities in the Caribbean developed mechanisms for smarter, cleaner cities um, considering the significant stakeholders' contributions that would be necessary, what's your thought on that? Yes, um, very brilliant question. And it's also one of the questions that we've gotten um, a, a lot, especially for low and middle income countries um, who are still a bit further behind. Um, one of the things that can be done for the very first step is to close or to bridge the infrastructure gaps. Excuse me. Um, so in infrastructure gaps in terms of electrification, for example, um, so for example, in, you know, in, in Africa, um, sub-Saharan Africa, there are all statistics about how two thirds of the population don't have um, access to more than reliable electricity supply. Um, so that's a big challenge and you need to close that gap first um, before anything else. Because I mean, if there's no electricity supply, there's hardly anything you can optimize. Um, so closing those infrastructure gaps, getting the power into the buildings, getting the power into the industries, um, having the grid lines in place. Um, you know, when you have that, then you can think about um, what about the, the connectivity infrastructure gaps. So um, if we're going to transmit data from this set of buildings, um, do we have the Wi-Fi to do that? Do we have you know, the data access to do that? Do we have broadband to do that? So those infrastructure gaps are the fundamental things that need to be addressed. Um, I'm not an expert in the Caribbean um, context, but I would imagine that um, that should be one area to first of all prioritize. And then when you have that in place, um, the next stage is for the city authorities to look at the most viable collection of stakeholders to engage. Um, and then to engage them with a viable proposition. Thank you for your response, um, Olamide. Um, we have a next question from Enoch. I hope I am pronouncing your name correctly. Apologies if not. Um, the question is, in developing countries where data availability and access to reliable energy sources are major challenges. How can our Africa leverage this technology in terms of you know, the energy clock to maximize energy efficiency? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so that's a brilliant question. Um, yeah, um, you know, so like we said previously, closing those infrastructure gaps will be extremely essential. Um, however, in the meantime, um, you already do have some areas that have a certain level of you know those infrastructure in place. Um, so one thing the cities in these regions can do is to begin with those areas, and you know so for example in a city that has a massive population and a lot of them are in you know maybe urban slums, um, but then you have some others who are in the more developed areas of the city. You know you can look at those more developed areas and look at the ways to optimize energy use in those areas 
and perhaps um, based on the lessons from there, um, you can then apply them um, to other areas um, in phases. So that will be, you know, an idea just off the top of my head to start with where you already have the infrastructure in place um, and then kind of use the lessons learned from there um, and apply it in those areas where the infrastructure is still um, developing. Great, wonderful. Um, we do have a few more minutes before we end the presentation. So attendees, please send in your questions through the chat box um, while I do address some of the questions that have come in in advance uh, to the webinar. Um, one question, and of course, um, this has the in-trend of words around um, circular economy. So how does circular economy produce smart energy for cleaner cities? All right, yeah, that's a brilliant question. Um, the circular economy, uh, depending on you know how you define it, um, can be um, very tightly focused and can also be very broad and cross-cutting. So in some circles, you define it more in terms of materials and recycling and recovering materials um, as they go along from production to usage, uh, making sure that there's a closure in the loop and things don't end up in the bin and in landfill. Um, but then if you widen the scope, um, you think about it beyond just materials, but also um, around energy and making an efficient use of energy. Um, but the same or a similar set of principles or the similar set of ways of looking at things um, from the circular economy, in other words, looking at being efficient um, can be applied to energy. And that's at the very center of um, the energy clocks. So this energy clock is about we are using a whole lot of energy in this city. Even if we decide to switch from fossil um, electricity supply to renewables, uh, we still will be using a whole lot. So how, what can we do differently? We need to reduce, we need to get more efficient. We need to be able to do more with less. Um, and that's the principle of the circular economy as well. So when you think about you know, recycling materials, when you think about reusing materials or um, separating materials into pure waste streams, um, um, you know, things around remanufacturing, refurbishing, those are all concepts and principles of the energy economy, of the, of the circular economy. It's about getting more efficient so that you don't have to keep depending on extraction of primary materials, um, extraction of fossil fuels to make plastics, um, extraction of um, minerals to make the, the metals that go into the product but rather you want to be self-sustaining to some extent um, and you want to be efficient with, with the use of materials. So that same thinking, that same principle um, applies to the energy clocks as well, because you, know, you, you're not, you, don't, you don't want to keep depending on the supply of more renewables, the supply of more fossil fuels, because that then increases exponentially as your economy grows. So um, you need to start thinking more about how do you get more efficient with the supply that you already have, whether it's from existing fossil supplies or from the new renewable energy sources, you have to be more efficient. And that's the kind of thinking that um, circular economy can bring to the table. Thank you for your response to that, um, to that question. Um, one final question before we end the Q&A session. Um, the question is, what are your suggestions for the government of developed states to take policy for smart energy? Right, so recommendations for governments of developed states, if I'm right. Okay, yeah, absolutely. So um, it goes back to the point um, we've made um, earlier. First of all, um, it's about three things. So first of all, it's about recognizing that renewables alone wouldn't do the job. If we are indeed serious with achieving the Paris Agreement, renewables are extremely critical, extremely important. Um, but in addition to that, um, we're gonna have to get more efficient with how we use energy and they can take the lead um, because they have you know deeper pockets um, and they are you know richer economies um, second thing um, is that they need to be realistic with stakeholders and stakeholders expectations there are many different stakeholders involved who need to be part of developing energy clocks and it's for them to realize that energy clocks will not emerge automatically it will not emerge on its own they have to play a driving role 
a convening role in bringing those different stakeholders together and to think through the different ways to make energy clocks work in their particular context. Um, and the third thing that needs to happen, although this is less about the developed countries, rather it's more about the developing ones, is making sure the infrastructure gaps are closed. But well, even in the advanced countries, there are infrastructure gaps. In the US, there's been a back and forth of debates about um, the infrastructure bill, which has been cut down from about $2 trillion to now about $1 trillion. Um, there's been ratings that was given by the American Society of Civil Engineers repeatedly um, that put the infrastructure level in the country as below par. Um, so even in advanced countries, you do have infrastructure issues. And that third and final thing is to make sure that the gaps um, are closed. Brilliant. So with this, we come to an end of our Q&A session. Thank you so much, Olamide, for responding to all the questions that came through um, in advance to the webinar as well as during the session. Um, Thank you very much, Eva. So glad to be here.